Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a war, if uh, you did not know it, a uh, global conflict over the truth. The truth about what this world is, a truth over worldviews, but also who we are and why we are here. This is what our worldview really is, and people all around us are lost. Now, we use this term a lot when we refer to the non-saved that they're lost, but I don't think we really grasp just how lost people are. They don't know who they are. They've been convinced that they're just a bunch of evolved apes. They don't know where they are. They've been convinced by natural science that this world formed all by itself, magically, somehow or another, with all these amazing design features, and and they don't know why they're here. I mean, that's a tremendous level of uh, being lost. This is the world we're facing. It is a war, war for the everlasting souls of our kids, of our neighbors, who have become convinced by the lies of natural science and evolution. I'm going to give everyone a chance to uh, take down the lecture notes who wants them. There's our outline right there. And uh, if you don't know how to use a QR code, you just point your phone at the screen. A PDF will pop up and you can download the lecture notes for this. Well, to illustrate the impact that these teachings are having, uh, I want to first uh, kind of review where our nation came from. Our nation's founding fathers, like the Pilgrims, the Puritans, and Quakers, were deeply committed to living out lives of moral virtue. To accomplish this, they sought out newly discovered and and undeveloped lands where they could create a government that was based on biblical Christian doctrine. The Bible was the foundational document for the U.S. Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and the U.S. educational system. Prayer has taken place at every meeting of Congress since the very first session in 1774, as depicted in this stained glass from uh, 1848. And in fact, an archive of every daily opening prayer spoken at Congress can be found on the U.S. House of Representatives website. From our Pledge of Allegiance to our currency, our religious belief heritage is firmly visible. Our monuments in Washington and elsewhere proudly display this heritage. A quote from Thomas Jefferson on the Jefferson Memorial reads, God, who gave us life, gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? On the east entrance of the Supreme Court building, there is a a sculpture that represents great lawgivers. Most notable, front and center, is Moses, holding a copy of the Ten Commandments. The Washington Monument was capped with an aluminum capstone, shown here, that contains an engraving of the Latin phrase laus Deo, which means praise be to God. 95% of the founding fathers of the U.S., though that is those who signed the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, and the Articles of Confederation, were devoutly Christian. of them had known Christian affiliations. 27 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence had Christian seminary degrees. Now, this is an oft-quoted statistic, but one that can be a little misleading because at this point in history, the vast majority of your colleges were what we today we would call seminaries. They were founded by Christians, and they were largely Bible-based colleges. Well, in fact, 106 of the first 108 schools in America were founded by Christians, including several of the big Ivy League schools like Harvard, Princeton, and Yale University. Ten of the first 12 presidents of Harvard were ministers. uh, Princeton was founded by the Presbyterian Church. Up until 1902, every president of Princeton was a minister. And look at the goal of education as it was originally stated at Yale University, that every student should consider the main end of his study to wit, to know God in Jesus Christ and be answerable to lead a godly, sober life. Wait, how long has it been since that was the goal of education in this country? Well, did you know that the U.S. once celebrated days of humiliation, fasting, and prayer? Congress issued this proclamation prior to the election of the first president during the Revolutionary War. 
This proclamation by Congress was set on uh, May 17, 1776, and urges its fellow citizens to, quote, confess and bewail our manifold sins and transgressions, and by sincere repentance and amendment of life, appease his, that is God's, righteous displeasure, and through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, obtain his pardon and forgiveness. Presidents also issued days of humiliation, fasting, and prayer. This presidential proclamation was issued by John Adams, uh, the second president of the United States, at a time when the nation appeared to be on the brink of war with France. Adams urged the citizens to, quote, acknowledge before God the manifold sins and transgressions with which we are justly chargeable as individuals and as a nation beseeching him at the same time of his infinite grace through the Redeemer of the world freely to remit all our offenses and to incline us by his Holy Spirit to that sincere repentance and reformation which may afford us reason to hope for his inestimable favor and heavenly benediction. The first national <clears throat> thanksgiving Proclamation was issued by the Continental Congress in November 1777, prior to the election of the first U.S. president, George Washington, following the colonial victories in the battles of Saratoga. It should be noted that a, a lot of historical revisionism has taken place in recent years, attempting to redefine what Thanksgiving celebrations were originally. When I was in school, we were, even we were taught that Thanksgiving was all about thanking the Native Americans. But all you have to do is read these original Thanksgiving Day proclamations to, to make it clear that they were about one thing, and that was thanking God. Did they invite the Native Americans to join them in these celebrations? Absolutely. But the celebration was still about thanking God. George Washington issued the first Thanksgiving Day celebration under the new Constitution on November 26th, 1789 recognizing November 26 as, quote, a day of public thanksgiving and prayer. John Adams and James Madison also issued proclamations under uh, uh, proclamations calling on America to observe certain days with fasting, prayer, and thanksgiving. Perhaps one of the most beautiful is, is, the, is a proclamation that was written by Abraham Lincoln on October 3rd, 1863, in the midst of the Civil War. President Lincoln proclaimed a national Thanksgiving Day to be celebrated on the last Thursday in November 1863. Since then, Thanksgiving has been observed annually in the United States on this day. <sighs> Listen to Lincoln's. The year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come. Others have been added which are so extraordinary in nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. No human counsel has devised nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and voice by the whole American people. I therefore, therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in heaven. Just beautiful proclamation. Beautiful, beautiful proclamation. However, this tremendous Christian heritage of our nation is being attacked and erased from our public facilities, textbooks, and museums. Numerous suits have been filed by atheist groups like the American Atheist Incorporation or the F Freedom from Religious Foundation to have Ten Commandment monuments removed from our public facilities. Another apt example can be, can, uh, be found by visiting Washington, D.C., where you may observe instances of our Christian heritage being removed or hidden from visitors. For example, at the Washington Monument, you can find a display about its capstone. This 2000 uh, photograph from the year 2000 of the display shows the capstone position so that viewers could see the inscription, Laos Deo, praise be to God, 
which is translated in the, uh, in, in the description is tra- in the description in the reader card below the replica. However, this in, sh- in this 2007 photograph, you see that the cap was later repositioned so that no one could see the inscription. When criticisms arose, the National Park Service claimed the repositioning was inadvertent. However, the reader board was also altered during the renovation with a very specific deletion. The deletion was the removal of that last sentence, which read, quote, the casting was inscribed with the phrase, Laos Deo, praise be to God. Well, we're seeing troubling trends of moral decline in our once great Christian nation that appear to parallel a decline in Christian beliefs. As a predictor of where our nation is heading, let's look at the current state of the church in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, our church congregations are getting much smaller with many nearing the point where they will cease to be financially viable. The number of church closures is so great that the Church of England has set up a church, a closed church division to assist with the disposition of properties closed for regular public worship. Normally, a suitable alternative function of the property is sought, but if none is found, outcomes are either preservation or demolition. Today, regular church goers, uh, regular church attendance has declined between 1998 and 2005 by something like 15 to 22 percent. Regular church goers in all denominations comprise today only about 6.3 percent of the population. Today, there's only one church for every 1,340 people with an average congregation of only 84. Plus, only 2.5% of the population attend what we would call Bible-based churches. This church has been converted into a Sikh temple. This one has been, uh, is now a, the Musselburgh Museum of Dolls and Art Exhibits. This church has become a rock climbing center because of the high spires and uh, tall walls inside. And this was actually on their closed church division website. This is one of the alternative uses that was mentioned for churches seeking, seeking alternatives. Well, the decline in church attendance is almost certainly linked to the pervasive teachings of a non-Christian worldview, in my humble opinion. The teachings of, of worldview is most predominant in history courses, which now dominates science curriculum. See, we're no, no longer just teaching science in our science courses. We're no longer just teaching physics or chemistry or about biological systems. Science has got itself involved in teaching history. That's why we have our natural history museums. They're not science museums. They're teaching us a speculative history of the world as though it's an absolute fact. It is claimed today that you cannot even be a scientist without holding to philosophical naturalism, but this claim flies in the face of the history of scientific discovery, because the vast majority of the founding fathers of our various science disciplines believed that the God of the Bible created the cosmos and were very committed to the existence of God and for most Christianity. People like Sir Isaac Newton, Johannes Kepler, Robert Boyle, Copernicus, Galileo, Moreover, because these men of science believed the cosmos was designed, they concluded that it would be intelligible to the human intellect, which led to the scientific revolution. And because they believed it had been given order by a lawgiver, this led to the very concept of the scientific laws, like those devised by Sir Isaac Newton. They believed that by investigating his creation, they were getting to know the mind of God, in fact. Many of the early mathematicians, for example, believed that they were deciphering a divine language. Well, what about the beliefs of scientists today? In 1916, James Luba, shown here, performed a landmark survey in which he randomly polled 1,000 U.S. scientists as to their belief in God and immortality. He found that 58% of U.S. scientists expressed disbelief or doubt, in the existence of God, and near seventy percent among those, dis- were, uh, um, and, and near seventy percent professed disbelief amongst those described as greater scientists. 
Luba then repeated the survey close to 20 years later, and he found that the percentages had increased from 50 to 58 percent and 67 percent amongst the regular scientists and your greater scientists. Excuse, excuse me, I misstated that. They had increased from 58 to 67 percent amongst the regular scientists, and from 70 to 85 percent of the those classified as greater scientists. And Luber predicted that the numbers would continue to increase as education spread, education in our natural sciences. Well, to test Luba's prediction, whether this was correct, in 1996, Edward Larson, a professor of law at Pepperdine University, reproduced Luba's survey as exactly as possible and found that the beliefs of scientists had remained largely unchanged since Luba's original survey in 1916. He published the results in the journal Nature in an article titled, Scientists Are Still Keeping the Faith. See those expressing belief? Close to about 40%. Those possessing disbelief, right around the same numbers. <clears throat> However, in this original survey, Luba did not have access to the reference work that Luba had used, which was called the American Men of Science, which, no longer, which was no longer in publication at the time of Lar Larson's uh, survey. So he repeated the study using members of the National Academies of Science, which even Luba stated place them in the category of greater scientist. <clears throat> Note here the overall comparison of greater scientists who profess belief in God from 1914, 1933, and lastly in 1998. He remained largely unchanged in his original survey, but when he targeted the greater scientist, note that the numbers had far, fallen markedly lower. In summary to this uh, new survey, he stated, amongst the top natural scientists, disbelief is greater than ever, almost total. He had found that the highest percentage amongst the National Academy's uh, members was the mathematicians, with 14.3% believing in God. The highest number of disbelieving scientists and immortality was found amongst the biologists, with 65 0.2% and 69% respectively, and only 5.5% expressing belief in God. Most of the rest of the survey were agnostic. Well, the reason why these beliefs are troubling, the beliefs of the National Academies, is due to the function of this government agency, which is to, quote, investigate, examine, experiment, and report on any subject of art and science whenever, to, whenever called upon to do so by the Department of Government such as the Department of Education, and, quote, to advise on the scientific and technological issues that pervade policy decision, such as how science should be taught in our public schools. It is the, this is the function of the National Academies of Science. So in 1998, the National Academies published a booklet to encourage the teaching of evolution titled Teaching About Evolution and the Nature of Science. Edward Larson, who we uh, just met, wrote a review of this NAS publication that was titled Teaching About Evolution and the Nature of Science for the journal ISIS, an, an educational journal that he titled Evangelists of Science. He, re he reads this. Perhaps an even more per per pervasive theme in this book is how the NAS sees the nature of doing science. Quote, science dif differs from religion because it is the nature of science to test and retest explanations against the natural world. Science relies solely on naturalistic explanation and thus excludes so-called creation science and intelligent design concepts. Papurian falsification is affirmed as the norm for science and as satisfied for the theory of evolution. Indeed, the booklet stresses scientists use the word theory so rigorously that when applied to the occurrence of evolution, it means fact. Throughout this booklet, science is presented as the cumulative enterprise leading progressively to a better understanding of nature and its uses, an enterprise that students can one day participate in only if their teachers show them the way. These teachers should be evangelists for science. This booklet offers encouragement and tools for that missionary purpose. Believe me, 
these evolution, evolutionists see, these teachers that teach evolution see it as an evangelistic subject. The NAS pu published another booklet in 1999 that specifically attacked biblical creation titled Science and Creationism, A View from the NAS, in which they state, this is the publisher's description, the National Academies of Science states unequivocally that creationism has no place in any science curriculum at any level. Well, bolstered by such prestigious criticisms as the National Academies of Science, those upholding biblical creation have been the source of jokes and mockery. In this episode of the TV series The Family Guy, a doctor places creationists in the lowest position on his comparative IQ scale. And we're also beginning to see our religious liberties attacked. Well, bolstered again by such criticisms uh, from prestigious groups, people of faith in academia and science industry positions are being subjected to much discrimination and harassment. Let me show you a few examples. Roger DeHart, shown here, was a high school biology teacher at, in the Burlington Edison School District here in Washington State for 14 years, taught biology for almost 30. For much of his career, he encouraged students to question evolutionary presuppositions by drawing upon articles from peer-reviewed science journals and, and challenged evolution and introduced them to the concept of intelligent design. <clears throat> That all came to an end in June 1997 when a parent of one of DeHart's students sent a complaint to the American Civil Liberties Union. The ACLU quickly threatened to sue the Burlington Edison School District if DeHart didn't stop teaching intelligent design. In response to the threats of impending lawsuit, the district, took, the district removed him from his biology classes. Nancy Bryson, shown here, was the head of the Department of Science and Mathematics at the Mississippi University for Women until she gave a seminar to a university honors forum titled Critical Thinking on Evolution. She presented alternative views of uh, origins, including intelligent design, and the talk was reportedly well received by the students. However, immediately after her talk, a senior professor of biology stood and read a four to five minute pre-prepared pre diatribe against Bryson and her talk. He said she was unqualified to speak on the subject of evolution and said the presentation was, quote, religion masking as science. She was the head of the science department. Who's qualified to talk about evolution if not the head of the science department? Well, the following morning, several, or so she was told, professors of math and science complained to the vice president of academic affairs about the talk. That afternoon, the Vice President of Academic Affairs came to her office and asked her to resign effective at the end of the fiscal year without offering explanation. When Bryson refused to voluntarily res resign, she subsequently received a written notice that her contract would not be renewed that following Monday. As the editor of the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington, a journal, uh, Richard Sternberg published an article that mentioned intelligent design as a possible cause of the irreducible and specified complexity found in cells. Following this publication, he faced retaliation, defamation, harassment, and a hostile work environment at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, where he worked. In response, Richard, uh, Dr. Sternberg filed a complaint with the U.S. Office of Special Counsel, the agency charged with quote, protecting federal agent employees. After an investigation, the, uh, the Office of Special Counsel report stated that there was evidence to corroborate Dr. Sternberg's complaint, concluding that, quote, it is clear that a hostile work environment was created with the ultimate goal of forcing Sternberg out of the Smithsonian. Dr. Guillermo Gonzalez shown here, was a professor of astrophysics at Iowa State University until he published the book, The Privileged Planet. Now, the book does not espouse creation. I've read it myself, but it merely details the fine-tuning of the universe that is necessary for the existence of life. However, upon its publication, a professor of religion, professor of religious studies at Iowa State, initiated a campaign against Gonzalez for advocating intelligent design. 
which was aimed at denying Gonzalez tenure. The religion, the religion professor who led the campaign was also an outspoken atheist and the faculty advisor to the campus Atheist and Agnostic, and Nox, atheist and agnostic Club. Because that, that's what you have to be to teach religion in our major universities today. You have to be an atheist, right? <laughs> well, although Gonzalez had 60 peer-reviewed scientific papers at the time, exceeding Iowa State University's standards for excellence for tenure by more than 350%, he was denied tenure and lost his professorship. He had exceeded the, the requirem, required publications by 350%. They only wanted like 16 to 17 publications, and he had published 60 peer-reviewed articles by this point in time. It was clearly just about his views on intelligent design. Well, a documentary was eventually produced based on the privileged planet, which got this guy in trouble. <clears throat> this is David Kopage, who was the team lead on the Cassini mission to Saturn for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. After lending some of his co-workers the DVD, The Privileged Planet, he was reprimanded and demoted. Then when, when Coppage filed a lawsuit to protect his freedom of expression, he was fired by NASA. Raymond Damadian, shown here, was overlooked for a Nobel Prize for his work on developing the nuclear magnetic resonance technology that was the basis for the MRI, a decision that even the Smithsonian Magazine acknowledged was connected with his views on creation. In an article published in 2003 titled Prize Fight, Smithsonian Magazine states, it is, it is, but it is, not, it is difficult not to at least consider another explanation that the scientist on the assembly or in other positions of influence could not abide Demadian's staunch support for creationist science. Well, the Institute for Creation Research once had a graduate school that offered master's degree in various science disciplines. And I, in fact, was the last person to apply for admissions into the ICR graduate school. I thought uh, getting a master's degree in geology from the Institute for Creation Research would, be, uh, would add nicely to uh, my education and help me with my apologetics. Well, ICR decided to uh, move their school from uh, California, where it was, to Texas. And uh, when they moved to Texas, the Texas Department of Education refused to allow them to offer degrees in science. Not because of the rigor, but because of the worldview. They were teaching science from the creation point of view. They were disallowed to offer master's degrees in science, not because the program wasn't rigorous, but because of the view that was being espoused. They weren't teaching evolution. But they, uh, just some of the backstory on this, ICR had gone through a, a previous fight in California that similarly... The, the California Department of Education had challenged their ability to offer degrees as well when they first set, set up the school there. And they challenged the decision up to the federal level and won. So perhaps they assumed that by moving to Texas, to the Bible Belt, and having a, a legal precedent already behind them, that being able to uh, offer the same degree programs at Texas wouldn't be a problem, but they faced a similar challenge. They ended up uh, re uh, reorganizing the school into a school of biblical apologetics, and you can uh, get master's, degree in, master's degrees in Christian education and apologetics, and uh, I still intend to, uh, to pursue that. I uh, wrote an article on it at some point, that's the QR code for that, that was published in a creation magazine uh, about the fight that, uh, that ICR went through to uh, try to offer these degrees. But in fact, yeah, I was the last person to, to apply for a degree to the ICR's graduate school. No sooner was I approved than I got a letter let, to, telling me that the school was closing down. It was very sad. Well, to bring a, an, an, ex, an example of faith-based discrimination closer to home, um, I want to point out to the content of a handout that... Uh, that I received about a financial aid program for teachers while attending an orientation meeting when uh, entering a master's of education program at, at UW. Now, the same information on this can, can be found on the uh, Higher Education Coordinate, Coordinating Board website, which is where I copied and pasted this from. Uh, 
Now, this is a financial aid program that is specifically for teachers, and uh, there were certain qualifications for this, to, to, for this financial aid program. Here, here's the qualifying criteria for this. You must be a resident student of Washington State, yes. You must plan to complete an approved uh, program leading to residency teacher certificate or an additional uh, endorsement. You uh, plan to uh, be employed as a certificated teacher in uh, Washington K-12 through schools, and you plan to attend an eligible college at least half-time, um, and all that sounds good until you get to this one. You must not be pursuing or planning to pursue a degree in theology. You cannot you get this financial aid uh, if you... So to be a teacher, if you're planning on, if you're pursuing or even planning on pursuing a degree in theology, you would see. But I since learned, and this was a financial aid program specifically for teachers, and so I thought, well, maybe that was just a teacher uh, program. But I since learned that this discrimination does not apply just to teachers. Washington students pursuing a degree in theology are ineligible for any forms of financial aid. Student loans grants, or even work-study programs. You're ineligible for all forms of financial aid if pursuing a degree in theology. Now, what in the world? Ladies and gentlemen, our school systems has been taken over by people holding to a secular ideology, and they're teaching our children a non-Christian worldview. So let's look at the beliefs of young people to see how they are being impacted by this war of worldviews. <clears throat> Gallup poll figures show that the national average of people that believe in God is still very high, 92%. Now, this was a recent Gallup poll, but interestingly, in 1947, the national average was 94%. Since they've been doing this study, since 1947, when they first did this study, the, the number of people that express belief in God have, re have remained pretty consistent, which is a, it's a remarkably stable statistic, to say the least, especially considering the moral declination that we've seen over the last few decades. But when you look at how the question is phrased, it makes a little more sense. Uh, do you believe in God? And so there was a combined total. Do you believe in God? And do you believe in God or a universal spirit? You know what I mean? So yeah, a lot of people are going to be lumped in that universal spirit category. But 92%, that's still pretty high of those that believe in God or universal spirit. However, the, the survey also shows a dramatic decline in belief of our young people. Notice that the, those that are in the 18 to 29 category are almost a full 10 percentage points lower, so full 10% lower. The next, the other demographic that stands out as lower than the national average are those with graduate, with graduate degrees, those that are in higher education. A Barna survey revealed similar concerns. They found that 61% of today's young adults who were regular church attendees are spiritually disengaged by their 20s. 20% of those who were spiritually active during high school maintained a similar level of commitment in their 20s, they found. And they also found that only 6% of people in their 20s and 30s can be considered evangelical. Arguably, what's happening here is that our kids are being indoctrinated into an atheistic worldview by the false teachings of natural history and or evolution. I mean, you have, you have such, such a wide variety of, of life. And I don't think it's possible for one person. I mean... No matter how powerful he might be to just snap his fingers and create life, it has to come out naturally over millions of years probably. Half of me believes in the theory of evolution, probably because that's what I was taught. Four years of studies, unfortunately, um, have kind of brainwashed me towards evolution. I believe humans evolved to where we are today from single-celled organisms based on the, the theory of Darwinism and natural selection. I don't think that there was any sort of divine intervention. I believe evolution is um, pretty much proven theory. I don't believe in a higher order. Um, just because the fact that I haven't seen any, you know, proof or, you know, concrete evidence of that. And until somebody shows me, you know, that there is, then I'm going to have an inversion to organize religion and I'm going to stay on the basis of chemical evolution. 
He says he does not see any proof or concrete evidence. But when I look in the world around us, I see it. And Rome, Paul speaks to this in Romans 1.24. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature are clearly seen in what has been made. So that they are without excuse. But even though they, he continues, but even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And that is the nature of natural science today. There is abundant evidence of design out there. But they refuse to acknowledge the witness of their own eyes. And for many, I believe... Most people today believe in evolution not because they've been shown concrete proof of it, but because others believe in it and because they want to believe it. They want to believe it. People want to believe that what we teach is not true. They want to believe there's no God. They want to believe that they're not going to be judged after they die. They prefer to be convinced by Teachers that are saying what their itching ears want to hear, that they're, that they're just an involved animal and not going to be judged after they die. Well, when speaking to Nicodemus, G- Nicodemus, Jesus said, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe I speak of heavenly things? See, if a person does, if a person does not believe the historical content in the Old Testament, how can they trust the spiritual content in the New Testament? If any portion of the Bible is challenged... And if those challenges go unanswered, it will eventually cause the trust in the Bible to diminish in a person's mind. If they can't trust that event, the events in the Old Testament took place as recorded, how can they trust the events in the New Testament took place as recorded? It will erode a person's trust in the, uh, in the Bible, in a person's mind. Well, to stem the tide of the loss of faith taking place today amongst young people, it's important that we be prepared to answer the lies and false teachings that are causing them to walk away from the church. But sadly, our Christian schools today are not defending the Genesis record and upholding the biblical worldview about creation. Instead, they almost universally teach theistic evolution. Evolution is true, but we still believe in God, which is uh, itself a very slippery slope leading to naturalism. Once a person thinks, well, my, ch- my Christian school says evolution happens, so, you know, must be true, and there you go, faith is diminished. So let's look at this. In 2011, the uh, results of a survey was published by the American Research Group of the views of faculty members on biblical creation at our Christian colleges and universities. 312 faculty members were surveyed at 200 Christian colleges and universities in the country. They surveyed the, head, the faculty members of the religion department, faculty members of the science department, the president and vice president. But the faculty members of the religion and science department, uh, some of the questions they asked them were very telling. Let's look at a couple of these. Faculty members of the religion and science department were asked this question. Do you believe the Bible is literally true? Or, I, I probably refer mostly to like a literal creation event true. Although the numbers are close, you see there, it's troubling that a higher percentage in our religion department disbelieves that the Bible is literally true. 22% say no versus 14% in the science department. When asked about a literal creation, the differences between the religion and science department were significant, but again, not in the direction that most people would think. It turns out that that the number of faculty members in the science department who believe in a literal 24-hour days of creation is much higher, 71% as opposed to 56% in the science department. When asked, do you believe the flood was a worldwide, local, or non-literal event, only 57% of the religion department believe the flood was a global event. 30% said it was local And quite disturbingly, 12.3% said it was a non-event. Don't believe that the flood was a real event at all. See, theistic evolutionists are willing to mythologize, delete, or completely disregard the historical events of Genesis' first 10 chapters of of the book of Genesis to bring the Bible into agreement with natural history. 
Personally, I think these Christian school teachers who are teaching an atheistic-based natural history of the world are going to find themselves in trouble. James, the brother of Jesus, warns teachers that they will be under stricter judgment. He said, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Better be teaching what you know to be true. Personally, I cannot, I cannot ethically teach at a public school. Couldn't do it. I just be, wouldn't be willing to go into a biology class and teach a bunch of these uh, kids things that I knew were, were, were not true, false teachings and lies that would potentially impact their ability to believe, come to a saving knowledge of Christ. I, wouldn't, I just couldn't do it. Couldn't go into a public school and, uh, and, uh, and teach evolution. I, I just couldn't do it. Wouldn't ethically be willing to do it. Well, I want to point to another couple of surveys uh, to help better understand what is happening. In April 2009, Newsweek declared on the cover of its magazine, The Decline and Fall of Christian America. Who would have ever thought this would happen? Do we understand the times? The feature article in this issue was entitled, The End of Christian America, and it summarized the results of a 2009 Newsweek survey in which the author states, that the percentage of self-identified Christians has fallen 10 percentage points since 1990, from 86 to 76 percent. The number of people willing to describe themselves as atheist, atheist or agnostic has increased about fourfold, from 1990 to 2009, from 1 million to 3.6 million. However, 3.6 million is still roughly only about 1 percent of the population. Uh, which is like 335 million, yet they have a great influence over the culture because they become aggressively involved in politics and education. And the church has kind of backed out of those roles. They continue, the present, in this sense, is less about the death of God and more about the birth of many gods. But is this true? Former President Barack Obama said the same thing. In his autobiography titled The Audacity of Hope, published in 2008, he said, whatever we once were, we're no longer just a Christian nation. We are also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, a Buddhist nation, a Hindu nation, and a nation of non-believers. Essentially, he's saying we are a nation of many gods. However, it's simply not true to say that we're becoming a nation of many gods. What is really happening is a shift towards no religion. Although the majority of people in the country are Christians, a total of about 68%, according to a 2020 Gallup poll survey, we are seeing that the number of people that declare themselves to have no religion has risen from 1% in 1950 to 20% in 2020. During the same time period, the number who identified themselves, identified as other religions, increased only 3% from 3 to 6 So what we're seeing is a move towards no religion. The number of people who stated that religion is very important in their life declined by 10% also between 1992 and 2020, from 58 down to 48%. When we consider the growth of those claiming to be non-religious, it is clear that teachers are saying what people's itching ears want to hear. Paul wrote to Timothy, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. It's clear that teachers are saying what itching ears want to hear. What is happening today was prophesied well by Paul in his letter to Timothy. Well, this is the essence of secular ideology, such as natural science. There is abundant evidence of design all around us, and yet they refuse to accept the witness of their own eyes and have turned aside to myths. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a war of worldviews, to be sure. The teachings of naturalism, evolution, are in direct conflict conflict with the Bible's teachings. They are an impediment that keep people from coming to the faith, and they are the root cause of the loss of faith occurring today, particularly amongst our young people. The teachings of evolution are also, they also have a terrible impact on how we perceive ourselves. 
how we perceive humanity. Parents, what did your child learn in school this year? Mom and dad, the kid says, today in school we learned about human origins and it totally changed the way I see people. See, if we view people as just an animal, you will treat them like one instead of loving them as ourselves like we are commanded. I want you to listen to a summary of how evolutionists view humanity. Now, this is William Provine, a professor of evolutionary biology at Cornell University. Now, listen to how an evolutionist views humanity. The volume on this may be a little high. I didn't have a chance to check this. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear, and I must say that these are basically Darwin's views. There are no gods, no purposive forces of any kind, no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I'm going to be completely dead. That's just all that's going to be the end of me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for humans either. See, atheists like Provine often deny the existence of human free will and instead argue that our behavior is merely, merely a consequence of biochemical reactions and uh, animal instincts and thus free of judgment. But everyone acts out free will every day. You make decisions every single day about whether to do something you know is right or something you know, know is wrong, but troubling. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will either. That's how evolutionists view humanity. This is a war of worldviews between atheism and theism for the souls of humanity. Understand atheism, when applied to the physical world, led us to what we call naturalism, philosophical naturalism. The view that everything came about through purely natural processes, that all physical phenomena must be explained as occurring through purely natural processes, and it's the adherence of all scientific inquiry to philosophical naturalism. When uh, naturalism was applied to the biological world, this is what led to evolution. And when evolution was applied to humanity, this is what led to humanism. Humanism. Humanism, <clears throat> humanism is not just a worldview, understand, but the world's oldest religion. A religion that worships man, or in its moderate forms, holds that man is independent of a creator God. It began when Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the forbidden tree to receive the knowledge of good and evil. Following this simple act... Humankind began to view itself as autonomous, self-directed, and godlike. A person upholds humanism whenever they place their own views or opinions above the Word of God. The Greek philosopher Protagoras summed up the stance of humanism with the maxim, man is the measure of all things. He held that each man is the standard of what is true to himself, and that all truth is relative to the individual. This is one of the tenets or doctrines of humanism, which are expressed within the Humanist Manifesto, first published in 1933, revised subsequently in 1971 and 2003. Other tenets include atheism, evolution, moral relativism, human autonomy, and world government. Although atheist or secular humanists represent a very small portion of the population, Again, they've exerted a, a great influence over the culture through political involvement and the media. From the, the What We Do page of the American Humanist Association website, they say, located in Washington, D.C., the American Humanist Association advocates for progressive values and equality for humanists, atheists, free thinkers, and non-religious. With our extensive local and national media contacts, our lobbying and coalition efforts on Capitol Hill, and the efforts of our grassroot, grassroots activity, activists, we ensure that the humanist point of view is represented. The idea that you can be good without a belief in God. Barack Obama identified himself as holding to secular humanist ideology in his uh, autobiography quoted uh, previously. He said this, 
I was not raised in a religious household without the help of religious texts or outside authorities. My mother worked mightily to instill in me the values that many Americans learn in Sunday school. Honesty, empathy, discipline, delayed gratification, and hard work. A statement that was celebrated by the American Humanist Association, who uses the catchphrase motto, good without God. But the truth is, we are not good without God. We have a terribly sinful nature. Sin rolls out of us innately, instinctively. We lie at slightest provocation, cheat and steal. We hate on one another. The civil unrest we are seeing today is a result of one of Satan's main strategies to divide us and get us hating on each other. And it appears politicians want that too. To be good, we need God's moral guidance, his laws. We need discipline and consequences. We need uh, the rod and the staff and the conviction of the Holy Spirit to be good and not do things we know are wrong. But a society that views itself as just another animal and denies the existence of a lawgiver as a source of the ultimate foundation of ethics, there inevitably will exist a society based on man's opinions rather than God's word, a community full of lawlessness, a community that is accepting of immoral behaviors like homosexuality, a community that is apparently tolerant of exposing kids to sexualized teachings in public schools and public libraries. I want to go off on a little tangent on this, but uh, I try to restrain myself. I mean, what in the world? We have drag queens reading to kids in our public school libraries. These are homosexual men that are involved in the porn industry reading to children in our libraries. But when Kurt Cameron, a Christian, tries to organize a book reading of his faith-based book, faith book at libraries, he was refused by more than 50 of them stating it did not align with the values of the community. So Facebook but doesn't align with the values of the community, but we also have a community that legalizes abhorrent practices like abortion. And if we don't stop the current trends in moral declination, I fear the legalization of pedophilia may be soon at our doorstep. The level of depravity taking place today against our children is hard to fathom. In addition to being killed by abortion, they're being coerced to change their gender through puberty, puberty blockers and mutilating surgeries and sold into sex slavery. Ladies and gentlemen, we are far from good without God. Jesus spoke some of his harshest words against those who would cause children to sin, stating this, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it is better for him that, he, the, that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned into the depths of the sea. I mean, for some of it, I just don't understand. I mean, what's more lovable about this world than the kids, than the children? You know, as a teacher, that's what you do all day long is just love on the kids. And it's heartbreaking to see what they're doing in these public schools to these kids. A kid decides he wants to transition to another gender. They hide it from the parents and uh, help it along. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, we must. How should we respond? Well, we, we need to recognize that people all around us are lost again and lost on a profound level. They don't know who they are, they don't know where they are, and they don't know why they are here. This is a war for the everlasting souls of our kids and our neighbors who have become convinced by the lies and false teachings of evolution and natural science. And we have to recognize that we are in possession of a great truth and that we must share that truth. First and foremost, the way to fight this war is by leading the lost souls around us to a saving knowledge of Jesus. That's how we win this war. We need to get involved in this war, but that's how we get involved. By sharing what we know. 
We got to remember people all around us are lost. People that we see walking down the streets, people that we see in supermarkets. Start dropping the name of Jesus, dropping the name of God. Get those conversations started. Let me close out in a word of prayer. Father God, we, uh, we are so terribly concerned for the nature of things, for the moral decline that's taking place in our country and around the world, for, the, for, what, is taking, for what is happening to the kids these days. Kids that are being sexualized at such early ages told they can change their gender. Father, we, we pray for the protection of the kids. Pray for the protection of these children that are trapped these days in public schools. And, and Father God, we pray for their parents, a conviction for their parents to get them out of those schools. Homeschool them if they have to. Get them in a Christian school if they can. Father, we pray for these kids. And, and Father God, we ask you to help us, Lord, to, to know how to respond. How, what, how, what, can we, what should we do, Father God, to get involved with this war over worldviews? What should we do, Father God? Father God, we ask for wisdom. We ask for insight. We ask you to help us to be an effective witness for you, Father God. And Lord, we ask for motivation. We ask for motivation to help us be a witness, to speak the name of Jesus at every opportunity, to testify about your grace and mercy, to testify about the truths that we know that this world was made by an almighty God. And we have not evolved animals, but we have been made in the image of God. Father God, help us to be bold in sharing these truths to a world that is lost, Father God. Help us to be bold, not to shrink back from the science and the teachings of natural science, but help us to be confident in the knowledge that we are in possession of a great truth. And we need to share that truth, Father God, to a world that is lost and dying around us. Praise you, Father God. Father God, go with us tonight, Father God. Help us uh, to internalize this message, Father God, and, to, uh, and speak to us tonight through your Holy Spirit. Help us uh, to know what we should do, how we can get involved in this fight, how, who we need to talk to today about the saving knowledge of, of Christ. Praise you, Father God. Lord God, we praise you. We thank you again for today, and I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share today in both my classroom and tonight, Father God. Praise you, Lord God, and thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen.